And now I'm really excited that we've arrived at this year's Class Day Address, which will be presented by writer and editor Gia Tolentino. In preparing for my introduction of Gia, I tried to remember when I first got to know her. I heard about her long before I met her, but not through the channels that you might imagine. Gia's partner, Andrew, was my student years ago, almost a decade ago, I realize, with some shock at the passing of time. He's now a senior associate at Shop Architects in New York, and he remains a close friend. So I, I learned of and finally met Gia through Andrew, and have watched both of their careers take shape, take off, really, since that point. I first admired Gia for the way that she grounded her partner, patiently enduring our world of design school and all that it entails. And then I started reading her, first on Jezebel, listened to her on various podcasts. I highly recommend the long form podcast episode 183. And I started reading her in The New Yorker when she became a staff writer there in 2016. Gia's writing is smart, sharp, original, and thought provoking. In the introduction to her book of essays, Trick Mirror, which she published in 2019, Gia writes, it was worthwhile, I told myself, just trying to see clearly, even if it took me years to understand what it was I was trying to see. I'm really thrilled that Gia has joined us here today to talk about seeing, to talk about understanding, to talk about the messiness of our lives that often stands in for tidy conclusions. Hi, Gia. It's great to see you. I take it from your background that you're in upstate New York, and I'm wondering if we're going to get a glimpse of baby Paloma or, or Andrew. So I'm not oh. hearing <laughs> Gia's audio. There we go. Now all of a sudden, OK. I am in beautiful upstate again. New York. But I have sent the baby and Andrew out of the house for this portion of the day. <laughs> it's so good to that's see so you. Respectful. That's so respectful <laughs> of our, our ceremony. I would have loved to hear by a crying baby just to get well, you a might, of her life. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you very much for agreeing to be our Class Day speaker. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And I turn the mic over to you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Well, hello everyone, and congratulations to all of you for making it to this moment, which like life itself is strange and thrilling and unrepeatable, even as it continually dissolves in the texture of the ordinary. I hope that all of you find time today to encapsulate your instincts in a form that you'll be able to revisit later. And I hope you feel particularly aware of your untested potential and that this feeling returns to you and you to it over and over, both in your life and in your work. And also I'm, I'm really thankful to Sarah and to the Harvard Graduate School of Design for inviting me to speak to you, though I feel that there is a not insignificant possibility that me being here right now is a joke that someone is playing on all of us. I have to disclose to you that my awareness of built space is under certain circumstances completely non-existent and that honestly, the only creative and critical practice that I understand is writing. And these days, I hardly feel that I understand anything about it. As Sarah mentioned, my boyfriend is an architect, uh, fortunately for me, because otherwise I'd be living in a nest of clothes and books on the floor, probably. And on the very rare occasions that I have you know, ventured a glance at a drawing set that falls out of his backpack, I turn into the math lady meme, you know, like troubled by an influx of disturbing questions such as what are ceilings made out of? Which is to say, I admire so much the way that your work is concrete and actual, where mine consists of letters that you scroll past on your way to your email. And I'll admit to you up front that I have absolutely nothing to offer you in terms of traditional insight about design. But of course, this is not a typical year. It has not been a typical year. This is round two of virtual commencement. We might as well take a moment to collectively acknowledge what the months since March of 2020 have contained. About 3 million people have died in this pandemic around the world and COVID is still ravaging India and other countries as we speak. Over half, Amer over half a million Americans have died with a death toll five times higher in black and Latinx communities. One in seven people in America has been hungry. Almost 3 million women have had to leave the workforce, a disproportionate share of them women of color. School and work and caregiving were upended, set at odds, made impossible, 
patchwork back together by extraordinary effort. The existential porousness that makes us human was reconfigured as a source of possibly fatal danger. We were separated from our families. We zoomed from our closets and got cut off after 40 minutes. Many of you, if not all of you, have had an entirely different experience of graduate school than you had hoped for or maybe expected and are wondering now how to recreate and reform the camaraderie and connection that you want and you need. We are all still readjusting after this long, long stretch in which so much was incommunicable and unwitnessed, so much joy and struggle and pain. But because of this, we began to see differently. The structures that determine the texture of everyday life became that much more visible. The criminal inequality in this country became even clearer as the population was divided into those who can work from home and those who would serve them wearing a face mask. The late anthropologist and activist David Graeber's axiom that the greater social value produced by a job, the less a person is likely to be paid for doing it took on a new meaning. And on many weeks, it felt like there was nothing to do but to bear witness to George Floyd's murder a year ago, to the armed mob storming the Capitol, to Asian elders being attacked on the streets. The way we live often seems fixed in place by inertia, by obligation, by convention, by the heavy pressure of incentive. But nearly overnight, 15 months ago, we began doing things that we never thought we would, never thought that we could stand to. In last year's protest summer, revolutionary change seemed not just necessary, but possible with one in five Americans in the streets more than ever for a protest movement in this country. And so, I hope that the past year, the high stakes, the forced reset, the holding pattern, and now the slow release, I hope that it's freed you as much as it's jarred you. I hope that it's jarred you into a new state of freedom, an ability to let go of things that no longer interest you and to feel your way along new directions towards an understanding that there is no time to waste in service of the wrong ideas in the hopes of one day being able to serve the right ones. This year has reiterated in both good and awful ways that the unthinkable is possible. It has been an exercise in sustained uncertainty and an exercise in seeing beyond. And those are the two ways I want to encourage you to consider your own process as a designer, as well as a person living in this unsteady world. It's taken me a long time to really understand and embrace the necessity of uncertainty, which can often feel like aimlessness or being adrift or being lost. I remember the last time I attended a commencement, it was my college, it was my college graduation in 2009. And the, re the recession had made me quite certain that gainful employment outside the food and beverage industry was well beyond my purview. I didn't know any professional writers, and I did not feel entitled to the aspiration to become one myself. I wasn't sure what to do, and I eventually joined the Peace Corps, and I went off to Kyrgyzstan and Central Asia to teach, to teach English, thinking that this would at least give me some sense of worthwhile purpose. And there, as it turned out, I felt less worthwhile, less purposeful than I ever had in my entire life. Every day I felt and was absolutely inadequate. I was living in the chasm between motive and outcome, between design and result. I was coming to understand the way that good intentions often reify hierarchies and disguise exploitative structures. I became aware in a real sense of my absolute tininess within history against the backdrop of policy. I spent much of my time in country confused and lonely, feeling both powerless and also too powerful unworthy of the global socioeconomic privilege that I felt that I was wearing like a crown. I was always in trouble and I was not proving to be essential to anyone. I eventually left early, re-entering the States bewildered, disappointed in myself, feeling that that had been my chance to be useful and that I had completely blown it and that I would thus never be able to do anything with any social value in this world. In retrospect, this was the most genuinely generative experience of my life. In some ways, the feeling that I had when I came back from the Peace Corps was similar to the feeling that I have now emerging from the pandemic year, horrified by the way of living that was configured as normal in America and also beset by a loaded, complicated longing to return to aspects of that life. Back then, I remember 
I would walk into a grocery store and I would cry so overwhelmed, so thankful, so nauseated at the fact of being able to purchase any kind of fruit or vegetable I could imagine, any number of products flown across the world to satisfy my passing whims. I could see things that I hadn't been able to see before, see what was desirable for reasons I could stand behind and what was desirable for reasons I couldn't at all. I began to understand that there was a kind of clarity that only comes from failure and dissatisfaction. I was oriented towards a particular reaction of simultaneous dread and desire that eventually became my critical foundation. I was able to identify the vectors that would define my subsequent intellectual and professional and political journey, one that I hope continues to change me as long as I can think. I couldn't have found this without opening myself up to uncertainty, to the unknown and the unexpected and consequently to failure. I had to let an experience unmake me in order to access something intrinsic. And so here we are, probably having all been unmade in some way recently. We have this moment right now where the signs have been blown down and the old maps aren't working. We've had time to stop and ask ourselves and each other, if we had a chance to remake the systems around us, how would we do it? And what can we do in service of this alternative vision, not one day in the future, but where we are right now? What I'm really talking about is the necessity of cultivating negative capability. If you haven't heard this term before, I will clarify that it does not mean the capability of being negative, which I think we can all agree that our brains have figured out just fine on their own. Negative capability, which in actuality denotes one of the most constructive things a person could cultivate, is a term coined by the 19th century English poet, John Keats, who used it to describe the ability to dwell in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, as he, put, as he puts it, without any irritable reaching after fact or reason. This importantly doesn't mean the rejection of fact or reason. It means the suspension of the need for a fixed explanation or a satisfying conclusion. Negative capability is the capacity to stop thinking of the unknown as something to eradicate and begin conceiving it as the source of what we're after with the understanding that our potential, both individually and collectively, lies in what we don't yet know or see. The Harvard Law professor Roberto Unger draws on negative capability for his theory of false necessity, which is essentially an argument that the structures we think are fixed are actually plastic, that everything has been made, which means it can be remade. We've seen a glimpse of this over the past year maybe a bigger glimpse than has been possible in a long time. To give just one overarching example, we can, we've seen that we can change nearly everything about our collective daily existence to protect the public good. Unger writes that we can understand ourselves and our history without imagining ourselves to be the object of a law giving fate. We can recognize the shaping power of what we ordinarily take for granted the deep structures of institution and belief established in the societies to which, we, to which we belong. But then he adds, we can also rebel against the worlds we have built and we can interrupt our rebellions and settle down for a while in one of these words, worlds. We can explain what has happened and what might happen, giving due weight to the reality of constraints on the transformative will without either diminishing our explanatory ambition or surrendering to the illusion of false necessity. He writes, and this is an important part, precisely because we are not fully contained in the social worlds we make, precisely because there is always more in us than there is in them, we can see a little bit beyond them, thinking the thoughts and doing the deeds that they do not countenance. This is what it means to cultivate negative capability. And it's a process I think that's incumbent upon us as people, incumbent on me as a writer and incumbent on you as designers to grasp the world as it is, not to work more smoothly within it, but to test its edges, to understand that it can be changed, to understand that none of it was inevitable and none of it is final, that there's always more in us and the people around us than what is recognized or suggested, that is what is recognized or suggested and that the choices we're told matter most are often distractions from the fact that it's the things that are not presented to us as choices 
that we need to understand as such if they're ever to be changed. In a way, this is common sense and you already all understand it. We are all in the business of imagining and moving towards what doesn't yet exist. But it's the work of a lifetime to remember that we should always be pushing against our known horizons. As Unger writes, we have to reach beyond the world as it's given to us. And to do this requires daily constant humility and openness and pliability. It requires us to be aware of what, what we or others might consider marginal or irrelevant. It requires us to carve out possibility by denying the inevitability of what's given to us. Our professions and our world, which is increasingly driven by social networks that demand constant quantifiable reactions of alignment or opposition, applause or rejection, the world can often configure uncertainty as paralyzing or undesirable or inadmissible. But to cultivate negative capability means seeing uncertainty as desirable and sustainable and always built in. So what gets in the way of this approach? Sometimes I think an inability to admit failure does, either our failures or the failure in our context. The artist Agnes Martin once said that feeling insufficient is the natural state of mind of the artist, that a sense of disappointment and defeat is the essential state of mind for creative work. I'm sure we're all quite familiar with this particular truth as it manifests in all of our individual emotional lives, but it's our task maybe to not try to cover this up in ourselves or recoil from it in each other. And maybe to understand failure as always a beginning, never an ending, a state that we can't escape entirely and should never expect to. I wonder if we can think of our world in the same way, our institutions and our systems. To understand disappointment as the natural state of mind of contemporary living, given these levels of inequality, this ecological destruction, this country's foundation of genocidal racism, the violence of capitalism and what appears to be its terminal stage. I wonder if we can love our dissatisfaction, view it as essential. Remember that dissatisfaction is what makes us reach further and keeps us alive to possibilities both seen and unseen. What also gets in the way is noise, of course, the sort of feedback and static that obscures the potential that inheres in simple presence and attention. Despite the distance that defines the past year, many of us had an irrefutable reminder in the protests of this potential, of what can happen when people are physically together, paying attention to each other and to the world. But as we know, the open-ended consciousness that many of us are coming out of the pandemic year, hoping dearly to retain and to deepen, it is powerfully vulnerable to the status quo and to the temptation of melting back into familiar categories and patterns. And we are incredibly handicapped in our capacity to think into the unknown by the fact that we all, I'm just guessing, have smartphones and thus have made ourselves reachable as the late writer Mark Fisher, known for his blog K-Punk put it, we're reachable by the imperatives of capitalism at every point in the day at any place in the world. What better device than an iPhone to prevent a person from cultivating negative capability? After all, iPhones don't tolerate uncertainty. They blast us with information and stimulation and various forms of the given until all we are often left with is the existential state that is least conducive to changing or creating anything, a dull anxiety, exhaustion, and unease. I would guess that most of you are drawn to design as a practice that engages your sense of negative capability that gives you a process to understand how we are, how we act, how we meet or fail to meet our needs and, want to, and what unexplored space lies beyond that. I'd guess that you're drawn to design as a process that asks you to make sense of things as they are in order to envision how they might be, a process that actively generates questions and requires you to map out possibilities in return. To practice in other words, that makes you more present in order to allow you to see beyond. This is the essential reason that I write, but I still forget this constantly. I have to remind myself by saving spaces to write that are open-ended, that are aimless, that are not monetized, and that are outside the systems that otherwise govern our work. I want to encourage you to do this with the impulses that made you a designer. We often enter the professional world thinking that the more successful we are, 
the more we will be free to fly the flag of our deepest values. But it's equally likely that success will divert you from those values unless you are constantly making active choices to the contrary. Essentially, every system at work in this country pushes us towards individualism over collectivity, towards comfort and self-satisfaction over discomfort and humility, towards stasis over change. It's my hope for all of us that the instincts that drew us towards our own processes of sense-making and possibility mapping will make us more present in the world, not as it's given to us, but as it really is and as it could be. And these days, as far as negative capability goes, I've been asking myself over and over, what have I previously failed to see as possible in terms of accountability to others? The structures that surround us do not lead towards solidarity and often appropriate it. Just as capitalism has a way of seamlessly absorbing anti-capitalist impulses, capitalist individualism often satisfies our desire for collectivity in ways that ultimately benefit the individual above all. Part of the problem to me is the way identity is often presented to us as primar primarily a matter of individual authority and subjectivity, rather than as it could be, primarily a grounds from which we access common interests and common struggles, common efforts to change our collective situation. All year, I've been thinking about something the organizer Miriam Kava wrote in 2019. Who are you accountable to in this world, she asked, because that will tell me who you are. Richard Powers writes something similar in his novel, The Overstory. Whoever you're accountable to, you will grow to resemble them in the end. You might be listening to this and thinking, yes, this sounds fine enough. This sounds like all the stuff I've been thinking anyway, but how do we put this into practice? Concretely, what do we do? That's up to all of you to figure out. And I mean that to say it has to be every single one of our responsibilities to engage these questions in our particular set of circumstances and suggest answers to the people around us exactly where we are. There are no answers outside the particular. I was struck recently reading a passage by the British farmer, James Rebanks, who writes in his new book about the shift from traditional farming to contemporary big agri-farming, the sort of efficient, high yield American style farming with the sole goal of maximizing immediate profit, no matter the effects on the land or the animals or the workers or the climate. The whole system was so fragmented and specialized, he writes, that most people working within it were either ignorant of its unintended effect or worse, lost in a kind of magical optimism that somehow nature would be okay. There were profoundly important questions about the potential effects of each new technology that it was nobody's job to ask or answer. There was no mechanism for farmers or ecologists to judge whether a technology or a new practice was on balance a good thing or a bad thing and we didn't really know when we had crossed the invisible threshold from one to the other. God knows I'm not a farmer, but this has stuck with me. How do we make it all of our jobs to ask questions about the everyday particulars of the systems and the institutions that contain us, to reframe those particulars as fungible and plastic, vulnerable to change and open to possibility? How do we build this work into all the work that already exists? In pursuit of this, in pursuit of the processes of embracing uncertainty and seeing beyond, I urge you to pay close attention to the thoughts you have that can't be categorized or summed up neatly. Articulate in some form your unformed hopes, your reactions of dissatisfaction, your instincts that are reaching for something you don't understand quite yet. Pay attention to what you haven't said out loud, what you fear broaching, what you yearn for most deeply what feels too complex to see all at once or to talk about neatly. Hone in on whatever it is in you that is straining past the boundaries of our language and our governing structures. Make space for that in yourself and in others with all the sustained discomfort and confusion and conflict that it will entail. This, this continual daily, moment by moment, never ending process, this is the way to discovery and surprise and beauty and to the work that you'll be able to stand behind. This is the way to find more within us and in our world than we can currently see. I'm gonna leave you with two thoughts. 
The first is from the ecologist Robin Wall Kimmerer, who notes in her book, Gathering Moss, that mosses soak up water and grow prolifically when moisture is plentiful. But when the air dries up, moss becomes desiccated. For other plants, this would be fatal, but most mosses are immune to death by drying, as I'm sure all the landscape architects know quite well. For them, Kimmerer writes, desiccation is simply a temporary interruption in life. Mosses may lose up to 90% of their moisture and still survive to restore themselves when water is replenished. Even after 40 years of dehydration in a musty specimen cabinet, mosses have been fully revived after a dunk in a Petri dish. Mosses are icons, in other words, of negative capability. So if there's a part of you that feels like desiccated moss right now, just watch and be open and be ready for the rain. The second thought is from the actor Mads Mikkelsen, who was interviewed recently by Vulture. My approach to what I do in my job, and it might even be, might even be the approach to my life, is that everything I do is the next most, is the most important thing I do, he said. Whether it's a play or the next film, it is the most important thing. I know it's not going to be the most important thing, and, I, and it might not be close to being the best, but I have to make it the most important thing. That means I will be ambitious with my job and not with my career. That's a very big difference because if I'm ambitious with my career, everything I do now is just stepping stones leading to something, a goal I might never reach, and so everything will be disappointing. But if I make everything important, then eventually it will become a career. Big or small, we don't know, but at least everything was important. I think that's it. I think that's everything. Thank you for having me and congratulations to all of you again. Gia, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm really blown away. I have to admit that I was a little surprised that you agreed to do this talk so quickly when, when I in, sent the invitation to you because I can't imagine a harder year to give a commencement speech. You managed to avoid being Pollyannish or saccharine. Uh, you were direct and honest, um, but still gave us inspiration and hope with a message that I think couldn't be more accurate or more urgent for the moment. So I really want to thank you for that. And, and I can tell you that I'm going to return to your words again and again for my own hope through uncertainty and my appreciation of, of your intelligence and your guidance. So thank you so much. Thank you.